if you're fortunate enough to live in a dark area like I I do, I mean this area just has very few street lights around it, then it can be quite nice putting outdoor Christmas lights in, in winter and you know there's a scope to extend it further beyond where you can't reach normal power and run them from batteries. And this is where passive infrared detector modules come in handy because it means that you can have a battery powered string of lights like these that um, will only come on when there's people actually in the vicinity to appreciate them. And in the case of this one I've got a light a larger LED temporarily connected and as soon as my hand goes in front of that sensor it will light and it'll stay on for a while um, because that's using this little passive infrared module. Now these modules are just generic, these are available very cheaply on eBay um, and they're ideal for this application and the technology behind the passive infrared sensors is that if I, uh, ah here's a good start, these passive infrared detectors detect body heat. They're actually what are called pyroelectric sensors and they actually convert um, infrared energy from focused body heat into uh, a small voltage. And the way they do that, I'll show you one of the units in fact, I'll just uh, pop the lid off this. There's one of the pass infrared detector modules, the pyroelectric sensors. It's got a rectangular window because it's got two elements inside it. Now be careful not to touch the front of this because the greasy fingerprints can actually reduce the amount of infrared energy it can see. But inside these units is a pair of sensor plates. Uh, I'll draw them at the bottom here. There's a pair of sensor plates with the protective cover with a window in it and then Above that, there'll be a series of lenses. And the idea of the lenses is they focus it into fairly sharp pinpoints of energy. And inside these sensors is the two sensor chips, but wired uh, in series and in inverse parallel. So that one's generating plus and minus, and that one's generating minus and plus. And they're feeding into a field effect transistor and that's why there's three uh, pins in these. They've got a common ground, a positive, which you... Uh, I'm not 100% sure if you connect it directly to a power rail or if you have to current limit it. But then they've got the output and this will effectively act as a almost like a variable resistor. And the reason for the two opposing uh, pyroelectric sensors is that if there's... Whatever ambient energy is coming in will affect both of them and they'll cancel each other out. However, when some, a hot object walks in front of these lenses, you'll actually get focused points of energy passing across these. And that will cause a significant deflection, which is detectable by the, um, the field effect transistor and causes a change of resistance. There's also uh, another very high value resistor built into these packages just to keep it stable. And that's fundamentally what's in these sensors. They're, you know, they, they seem quite complex, but because they're used in passive infrared detectors and in lighting switches, you know, for outdoor lighting or the passive infrared alarm detectors or whatever, you know, they're just used in everything. They're actually quite mass produced and cheap. So to actually connect these to Christmas lights, you want to get some low voltage strings like this. This is a repurposed USB powered string of LEDs. It's got about 100 LEDs connected and it's designed to run roughly 5 volts and it relies on the resistance of the wire to actually, and one cable going way to one end and one coming to this end, to actively make sure that all the LEDs light evenly along its, its length. You know, you don't get bright, really bright at one end, staggering out to sort of lower levels. So to connect them, these sensors uh, have three pins. So let's go PIR module. And they have a positive pin, an output pin, usually in the middle, and a negative pin. And to connect this up to actually drive, we're going to buffer it. Now, technically speaking, you can, um, you can drive a very, very low load with the output pin, but I don't recommend it because the sensitive to these such these things as such that you know they, they measure minute variations in, in voltage from this sensor so they need a really stable supply this is why they all have a little 3.3 volt regulator built on and 
if you load it down too much, it can cause fluctuations. So that when the voltage, uh, when the um, El the load you've got connected directly to the output is turned off, the voltage fluctuates a little bit and it can cause false triggering again. So you're better using an external transistor to buffer it. And in this case we'll be using a, well I'm going to be using a BC547, but, but as in other projects you can use whatever standard NPN transistor, like a 2N3904 or whatever you can find. So we're going to supply it with, from the battery, battery, about 6 volts, say 5 to 6 volts and there's the battery negative it's worth noting that sometimes they refer to the positive in these modules as VCC instead of, uh, most of them just say plus 5 volts or just have a positive symbol but uh, some say VCC and uh, the easy way to work out which is the positive is one will be marked ground, one will be marked out, and the other is inevitably the positive. It's also worth noticing with some of them, that, uh, and there's a wide variety of these modules, the actual cover over the infrared sense, the lens here, actually covers the markings because they're on this side. It's a little bit of a... Uh, um, yeah, they didn't plan that too well. But anyway, uh, so here we get the module. We're going to take the positive out too the LEDs directly and the output is going to go via a resistor to limit the current into the gate of the uh, into the base of the transistor partly to protect the transistor and partly because you don't want to load this chip up too much to make ensure it's as stable as possible and I chose a resistor value of 2k2 which the color code for it is red 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 it's just nice and easy to remember and if that's the negative from the battery it's coming up to the transistor um, so that will be the emitter of a standard NPN transistor which is going to the negative. Basically speaking, when this turns on, um, it's going to put positive out to the base of the transistor, base, and it's going to pull the LED load down. The LEDs have already connected positive, it's going to pull them down to negative. So that's the collector that we're going to be doing that with. And we're also going to include a resistor in here to limit the current through the LEDs. And in this case, I chose about 47 ohms. Now, I was originally hoping that I was going to get off with just three cells, but I found that the only one of these units that was um, suitable for that was this tiny little one. And there are, again, there's multiple variations of these, so even they're not going to be all suitable. And I reckon the reason for that is that it's got a 3.3 volt regulator, they all have, but it's also got a polarity protection diode. In this case, it's a little Schottky diode dropping about 0.2 volts, but in the other cases, it's a standard silicon diode and it's dropping about 0.6 volts. And that's a huge difference because if you consider that the nickel metal hydride cells would have been 3.6 volts minus 0.6, it's below the voltage that the voltage regulator can reliably put out a stable 3.3 volts. So it is going to be subject to that voltage fluctuation problem. And if that happens, then they just re-trigger. They're so sensitive that, you know, as soon as the LEDs go off and the voltage in the battery just floats that tiny bit higher, it just causes it to false trigger again. They just, they go out and on and out and on. And you walk out of the room and look from a distance. No, they're still cycling on and off. So um, the easiest solution is just to use uh, four AA nickel metal hydride cells uh, to get a nice stable um, 4.8 volts, which is the four times 1.2 volts. So, 2K2, I'll just write that as 2,200 ohms. Put a VR over. Uh, and the 47 ohms. So that's what I've done here. I've made a little loom up for testing these. And at the moment into it, I've got plugged. I soldered the resistors directly onto the transistor. But at the moment, I've just got this uh, high power LED just for visual effect to show, show it in operation. So most of these uh, units are based around a very common chip called a BIS0001, that's B-I-S-S-0001. If you look for that on the internet, you'll easily find the data sheet. It's a super common chip. I really haven't a clue what they're using in this one, because it's a little 8-pin chip. It's very minimalist. Um, it could possibly be a dual op amp, although I'm not 100% sure about that. That would be quite clever trickery if they had done that. Although ultimately they're looking at a continuously varying voltage, and it's possible. I'm not 100% sure if it's a dedicated PIR chip. I guess it would be. But it's not marked at all. There's absolutely nothing on that, which is annoying. Now, 
Other things that are worthy of note, uh, these things tend to have a sensitivity adjustment, which will usually be marked on it, and a time adjustment. The sensitivity just determines how the range that it's going to detect. It's usually just best put up full. And the time, you want to set it down to sort of, not quite the minimum, but just off the minimum. But you may have to play about with these settings just to tweak them to get them absolutely perfect. Some of these also have, and I'll show you this, they've got little pads that you can link across. They're pre-linked and it's marked low and high. And in this case, the middle pad is linked to high. And on these ones, you actually have a physical link you can change. And the point of those is it's the, the, the it's going to pin one. It determines if it's what's called re-triggerable or non-re-triggerable. And the best mode for these is re-triggerable. Basically what this means is that when you walk in front of it and it detects you, if it's non-re-triggerable, it would just do one time delay. And then, it, you know, no matter if people were still walking about in front, it would still do that one time delay and then it go out. And then you, when you walk, you know, the movement continued, it'd reset again. So if there's a lot of movement, it just keeps going on and off all the time. However, if you set it to re-triggerable mode, it just, every time it detects movement, it just extends the time delay. It resets it to zero so that if there's continuous movement, the output will stay on all the time. And in the case of these, that's uh, with the link set to the position H, which is high, or as it comes with these ones. That function isn't available in this, it's just pre-configured for the uh, re-triggerable. These also, chip, these chips also, because they're designed for alarm systems and the outdoor lights control, they also have an input, pin 9. Pin 9 is called trigger disable input. And if you use an LDR, light dependent resistor, and a resistor connected to pin 9, and I think it's probably just tied, um, I reckon it would just be tied high, I'm not 100% sure, in this design. Um, it, if you were to actually use the light sensitive system, you could add the LDR, but I, I don't know how well suited these are to doing that. But it's to allow the daylight to be detected, and when it is daylight, it disables the output. But in these case, the case of these, if you've got a Christmas tree with LEDs in it, maybe you want them to light, you know, even when it's quite, it's starting to get a wee bit darker, maybe you want them to light all day as long as there's activity in the vicinity. Now, keeping these waterproof, if you put these sensors behind glass, they, they can't see through glass. I took some pictures with an infrared camera. Here's a picture of my hand behind glass. You can see an outline because it's got a standard camera that it superimposes with the infrared image. And you can see the glass is just blocking the image completely. On the opposite end of the scale, you have polythene. Now this is a standard polythene bag. Let me just grab one down here like this. And this is completely transparent to the infrared energy. That You know, there's very little difference uh, in the amount detected from the hand. It's not blocking much at all. And a good compromise for making these waterproof is plastic kitchenware like this. Because this is a, a picture of my hand behind this. And you can see it's still visible, but it's attenuated a bit, but it's still visible. So if you were to actually want to make this waterproof, you're a waterproof sensor and battery pack, you could put all this in this enclosure with a suitable uh, sensor. See, I'll just plug this one in, make sure I get it the right way around. I don't think it'd be damaged if I put it in the wrong way around, because I'm pretty sure there's a diode protection. And that will still be able to see through the plastic. Um, it, you know, it, if, as long as you put it right up close to it, it will still be able to actually detect people uh, passing in the vicinity. This, this thing's got a small stabilisation time delay before it kicks in. Most of them do have a sort of stabilisation period. So um, I'm not sure how well this uh, string of LEDs will show up if I plug it in. Is that going to show up? It's kind of showing up. It's not super bright. I mean, they aren't super bright because they're deliberately being run at quite low current uh, to keep it within, A, the range of the transistor, uh, and also just for maximum battery life. And it's quite nice in a way. I've got I've just set these in my... Uh, lounge for years now and you very rarely need to change the batteries they just it just sits there and when you walk in the lights light as you walk through the room and then they just go out as soon as you've left the room so um, they're, they're pretty versatile little modules they're quite nice to play with 
But um, as I say, they really do require a wee bit of tweaking. You know, you have to spend a lot of time uh, getting to know what these little potentiometers do and making sure you don't touch the circuit board while you're adjusting them because that can affect uh, the, you know, that could cause interference with the settings. But um, yep, they're uh, generically cheap. It's very easy to patch in a transistor and then you can drive modest little strings of lights on random trees in the middle of nowhere. It's quite a nice little thing.